This is the sixth day of this January 2022 seven day Rohatsu Sashin. And today I'm going to read from a book we read from last Sashin in November titled Swampland Flowers The Letters and Lectures of Zen Master Da Wei. <clears throat> da Wei was uh, one of the great Chan masters of the 12th century, the 1100s. He was born in 1088. Uh, <clears throat> left home at 16, and at 17, he had his head shaved as a monk. Uh, <clears throat> Among his teachers, his final teacher was uh, Yuan Wu, the author of the Blue Cliff Record. And uh, <clears throat> Da Wei was probably Yuan Wu's foremost student. Not going to read a whole lot about his life. Um, but here's just one incident. Uh, towards the end of his <clears throat> work with Yuan, Yuan Wu, uh, this was after a point where Da Wei had, had basically completed, completed his training and was actually had, I believe, co teaching duties with Yuan Wu. He said, when Da Wei entered Yuan Wu's teaching room, Yuan Wu would always listen to his words. Afterwards, one day, as they were going to their private quarters, Yuan Wu said, If there were a Chan man like me, how would you deal with him? Da Wei said, What unexpected good fortune if there were. As Tung Po said, Having been an executioner all my life, when I meet a fat fellow, I slice. Yuan Wu laughed loudly and said, Rather, it's you who should enter the room with me and be my teacher. You've pinned me to the wall. <clears throat> he died in, Dawei died in 1163. <clears throat> On the ninth day of the eighth month, after showing signs of illness, he told the congregation of monks, nuns, and lay people, tomorrow I'm going. Towards the pre-dawn hours after he'd written his last bequest and letter to the emperor, the monk who was at his attendant asked Da Wei for a verse. In a serious verse, Da Wei said, without a verse, I couldn't die. He took up the brush and wrote, birth is thus, death is thus, verse or no verse, What's the fuss? Then he let go of the writing brush and passed on. He had lived 75 years. <clears throat> Back in November, we ended in the middle of one of his letters, and I'm going to pick it back up. He says, <clears throat> once you have the intent to investigate this path to the end, you must settle your resolve and vow to the end of your days not to retreat or fall back so long as you have not yet reached the great rest, the great surcease, the great liberation. <clears throat> There's not much to the Buddha Dharma, but it's always been hard to find capable people. The concerns of worldly passions are like the links of a chain joining together without a break. Those who resolve as weak and inferior time and time again willingly become involved with them, unknowing and unawares they are dragged along by them. 
only if the person truly possesses the faculty of wisdom and willpower will he consent to step back and reflect. It's settle your resolve and vow to the end of your days not to retreat or fall back. So much more fiber when we know in our heart this is our path. This is the direction I'm going to go. I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to settle. Many people get into practice. Uh, They're driven there by personal problems, uh, painful situations. And after practicing for a while, some of these things resolve, begin to enjoy themselves a little more than they could before. And sometimes the uh, steam seeps out. People find themselves just going through the routine <clears throat> no longer as engaged as they were in the beginning. This is a serious business. It doesn't need to be solemn and overly formal or gloomy, but it's for real. <laughs> Reminds me of a kid in a movie I saw. What was it called? Search for the Wilder People said, shit just got real. It's hard to find capable people. Um, It's hard to, to imagine oneself as a truly capable person. But we're all works in progress. We all practice from where we are. Each of us has this potential. This is a journey of 10,000 miles. And here we take a step, or it's two steps. We're always battling against the world we live in. The ways, the ways of the world to which we've become so accustomed to our own habits. Our habit of thinking and planning when it's not necessary. <clears throat> our constant attempts to arrange things to our liking, to avoid what we don't like and get what we want. Buddha Dharma, the way of the Buddha Dharma, is not like that. It's not self-preference. It's not conceptualization. It's not chasing after sensual pleasure. It's not giving in weekly to habits. Of course we fail. Of course we go off course. We're garden variety people. <laughs> we, we have all the foibles and the, the shortcomings of a human being. We're a mix. The concerns of worldly passions are like the links of a chain joining together without a break. Everything in this world today seems to be arranged to strengthen those chains. The whole economy is based on people wanting things and buying them and being convinced that they need them. Was... uh, Not that long ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone. Now here they are. Everyone has one, it seems. 
Everything about it is designed to pull you away, to suck you in. <clears throat> and then there's drugs and alcohol and all the other things that can take us away. He says, those whose resolve is weak and inferior, time and time again, willingly become involved with them. Unknowing and unawares, they are dragged along by them. We see this happen. You know, all of a sudden, a new behavior grows up. We do something once, then we do it again. Somebody told me that's the, the business model of Starbucks. Uh, you get somebody in there to go, and then that's the thing I do. Every day on my way to work, I, get, I go to Starbucks. <clears throat> There's a new one that just went in on Monroe Avenue. Uh, I drive up there on my way to the center, and there's one of these, you know, the cars drive in. It's all a drive-through setup, and it's amazing. Out of nowhere, this thing sprang, sprang up, and now when you drive by, there's a line of cars looping all the way around the building, all hours of the day and night. <clears throat> Of course, coffee is nice. <laughs> yeah, it's the loss of agency. It's the, you know, the inability to step outside whatever routine we've developed. We get mired, no question about it. The reason that we are able to get deeper into our practice during Sashin is because we have this structure around us and we commit not to be pulled away by talking or <clears throat> other things that are going to distract us looking around. It's a little harder in a Sashin like this <clears throat> because we're not all at Chapin Mill, not all in the same building. For people at home, um, it's, it can be any number of different experiences. How much contact do they need to have with those around them? What is responsibilities do they have? But even for us here at Arnold Park, <clears throat> a dozen and more or more of us here all sitting together, it's still sort of informal and not as structured. And so it becomes our responsibility to to find the rigor within ourselves, to find our seriousness of purpose, and to take advantage of this tremendous opportunity. He says, only if people truly possess the faculty of wisdom and willpower will he consent to step back and reflect. <clears throat> that stepping back and reflecting is an important part of practice. Don't often talk about it. We're talking about dropping thoughts and <clears throat> merging with the practice. But you have to stick your head up every now and then and say, am I doing what I need to be doing? How is this working? It's a, it's a fine line between obsessing about conditions and results and just sort of blindly stumbling ahead, not realizing when we're going off the path, what we're doing that's, that's causing us problems. The ways that our grasping and aversion make practice more difficult. <clears throat> Getting back to, <laughs> to Da Wei, he says, Jung Chia also said, the real nature of ignorance is identical to the nature of enlightenment. The body, the empty body of illusory transformations is identical to the body of reality. Once you've awakened, there's not a single thing in the body of reality. Original inherent nature is the naturally real enlightened one.
we separate things into enlightenment and delusion. But this truth is in everything. It's everywhere. There's nothing that's not this truth. It echoes what we read last night from Ramana Maharshi. There is no greater mystery than this, that we keep seeking reality, though in fact we are reality. We think there is something hiding reality and that this must be destroyed before reality is gained. How ridiculous. A day will dawn when you will laugh at all your past efforts. That which will be on the day you laugh is also here now. This is our faith, our intuition, that is, is in the quote from Jung Chia, original inherent nature is the naturally real enlightened one, just as we are. We're all Buddhas. He says, if you think like this, suddenly in the place where thought cannot reach, you will see the body of reality in which there is not a single thing this is the place for you to get out of birth and death. What I said before, that one cannot seek the Dharma, which has nothing to attain with the attitude that there is something to attain, is just this principle. <clears throat> this is the motive energy behind working on a koan, is the, the, the faith that it's here, it's here. Why can't I see it? He says, <clears throat> gentlemen of affairs make their living within the confines of thought and judgment their whole lives. As soon as they hear a man of knowledge speak of the Dharma in which there is nothing to attain, in their hearts there is doubt and confusion and they fear falling into emptiness <clears throat> Whenever I see someone talking like this, I immediately ask him, is this one who fears falling into emptiness himself empty or not? Ten out of ten cannot explain. Since you have always taken thought and judgment as your nesting place, as soon as you hear it said that you shouldn't think, immediately you are at a loss and can't find your grip. You're far from realizing that this very lack of anywhere to get a grip is the time for you to let go of your body and your life. <clears throat> this is a stage of Sashin where often in the Dokusan room you hear people talking about their fear of falling into emptiness one form or another. When the mind gets really quiet, there's just uncertainty about who we really are. The whole structure that has been built up unconsciously since we were born becomes weakened. This is a good thing, but it's also frightening. <clears throat> People have to find their way through Sometimes it's a case of going deeply into the practice and then we bob right up to the surface, <clears throat> become frightened or disoriented. We need to just go in again. Gradually what was unfamiliar becomes familiar, familiar in a good way. We find the faith and the courage to let go. It says, as soon as you hear it said that you shouldn't think, immediately you're at a loss and can't find your grip. We're at a loss because we keep trying to think. 
That's our solution. <clears throat> That's what we do when we're pressed hard. It's not what's needed. We need to see. He goes on, Tun Li. That's the person this letter is addressed to. My friend Tun Li, my friend in the path. When we met in Pien in 1126, you were of mature age and already knew of the existence of the great matter. But with your vast erudition, you have entered too deeply into the nine classics and the 17 histories. <clears throat> These are evidently uh, works that were studied in, in ancient China. He says, you are too brilliant and your lines of reasoning are too many, whereas your powers of stable concentration are too few. You are being dragged along by your daily activities as you respond to circumstances. Thus, you are unable to make a clean break right where you stand. Powers of stable concentration. This is what we build up in our zazen. It's what we strengthen, of course, in seshin. This is what we feel <clears throat> late in seshin, to one degree or another. This is what can enable us to find equanimity, presence of mind, awareness in our daily life. The uh, <clears throat> zazen is like charging a battery. The purpose really is to be able to carry that mind of equanimity mind that's not caught up in thought or grasping or fear bring that into our daily life he says if correct mindfulness is present at all times and the attitude of fear for birth and death doesn't waver then over long days and months what was unfamiliar will naturally become familiar and what was stale will naturally become fresh. <clears throat> but what is the stale? It's the brilliance and cleverness, that which thinks and judges. What is the unfamiliar? It's enlightenment, nirvana, true thusness, the Buddha nature, where there's no thought or dis discrimination or figuring and calculating cannot reach where there's no way for you to use your mental arrangements. <clears throat> this phrase, the attitude of fear for birth and death doesn't waver. It's one of the reasons I like to read Ajahn Chah <clears throat> for myself <laughs> and for others. It's the value of reflecting on birth and death, on our situation, on old age and impermanence. Characteristics of life. look around and know. It helps when we don't want to do what needs to be done, when we want to just drift off into some kind of pleasant dream, numb ourselves out. That's why there is that inscription on the Han outside the Zendo, on the block. Don't waste a moment. Wake up. Wake up.
Not sure what he means when he says that which thinks and judges. <clears throat> He's describing what's stale. I guess we could say <clears throat> it's what we think is doing the thinking and judging. What is the unfamiliar? It's enlightenment, nirvana, true thusness, the Buddha nature, where there's no thought or discrimination or figuring and calculating cannot reach, where there's no way for you to use your mental arrangements. <clears throat> In practice, we need to, we exhaust all our mental arrangements, all our manipulation takes a while, hopefully not more than one lifetime, it takes a while to find a way just to look, just to be still. He says, suddenly the time arrives. You may be on a story of an ancient's entry into the path, or it may be as you are reading the scriptures, or perhaps during your daily activities as you respond to circumstances, whether your condition is good or not good, or your body and mind are scattered and confused, whether favorable or adverse conditions are present, or whether you have temporarily quieted the mind's conceptual discrimination. When you suddenly topple the key link, there'll be no mistake about it. interesting point here <clears throat> we have this idea that we have to be in a certain state of mind in order to see in order to have some insight but that isn't necessarily the case we certainly have to have had long periods of close attention of forgetting the self going deeply into the practice but the moment-to-moment -moment circumstances can, can turn on a dime. One moment, everything seems totally disjointed, and the next moment, we're there. Helps to remember this, and a lot of people who feel when they go into a bad patch that they're kind of out of the game. Well, this sheen is over for me, clearly. Uh, so... <laughs> So mistaken. You can spin your wheels for right up until the end and then find your footing. <clears throat> Next short one is called See the Moon, Forget the Pointing Finger says, a gentleman reads widely in many books, basically in order to augment his innate knowledge. Instead, you have taken to memorizing the words of the ancients, accumulating them in your breast, making this your task, depending on them for something to take hold of in conversation. You are far from knowing the intent of the sages in expounding the teachings. This is what is called counting the treasures of others all day long, <laughs> without having half a cent of your own. <laughs> Likewise, in reading the Buddhist scriptures, you must see the moon and forget the fingers. I think all of us are familiar with this image. Don't mistake the finger pointing. Don't think that the finger is the moon. Actually comes from the Sarangama Sutra, an analogy that the Buddha used. Don't develop an understanding based on the words. An ancient worthy said, the Buddhas expounded all teachings to save all minds. I have no mind at all, so what's the use of all the teachings? <clears throat> if they can be like this when reading the scriptures, only then will people with resolve have some comprehension of the intent of the sages. <clears throat> 
Well, clearly, Da Wei was not reluctant to take people to task. Memorizing the words of the ancients, accumulating them in your breast, depending on them for something to take hold of in conversation. It's easy to do this. There are a lot of people who are sort of Zen dilettantes. <clears throat> They're on the the internet. <laughs> you go to sites and hear people <clears throat> propound what they understand. Of course, anything that's uh, discussion on the internet is kind of disheartening. <laughs> Never, never go into the comments section. <clears throat> but it does, it is, it can be helpful to read scripture or to read even a book like this um, because it does awaken our interest and our intuition and it can be an aid. Roshi Kaplow always said, what's a good book? It's the one that encourages you to close it and do zazen. I think the first year of my involvement in Zen was reading books. Of course, back then in uh, <clears throat> the late 60s, almost all the books on Zen were nothing but staying sayings and <clears throat> Zen witticisms and philosophical accounts and there wasn't anything really about how to practice. It took a long time before I ever stumbled on the three pillars of Zen. The next letter is entitled Stories, Stories and Sayings. He says, these days in the Chan communities they use the extraordinary words and marvelous sayings of the ancients to question and answer, considering them situations for discrimination and beguiling students. They are far from getting to the root of their reality. When the Buddhas preached the truth, their sole concern was that people wouldn't understand. Though they had recondite and obscure things to say, they would then bring in other comparisons and similes to make sentient beings wake up and understand. For example, a monk asked Matsu, what is Buddha? And Matsu said, mind itself is Buddha. At this, the monk was enlightened and entered the path. What discrimination is there here? But if the monk hadn't awakened from this, then this very mind itself is Buddha would have been a situation of discrimination. <clears throat> there are places where Koans are used for discussion groups. People get together and talk about their different interpretations. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been there, so maybe some good comes out of it, but <clears throat> I don't think Da Wei would, would say so. When people engaged in meditation read the scriptural teachings and the stories of the circumstances in which the ancient worthies entered the path, they should just empty their minds. Don't look for the original marvel or seek enlightenment in sounds, names, and verbal meanings. If you take this attitude, you're obstructing your own correct knowledge and perception, and you'll never have an entry. <clears throat> Pan Shan said, It's like hurling a sword at the sky. No talk of whether it reaches or not. Don't be careless. Vimala Kurti said that the truth goes beyond eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and intellect. It is beyond the six senses. If you want to penetrate this truth, first you must clear out the gates of the six senses leaving them without the slightest affliction. What does affliction mean? It means to be turned around by form, sound, scent, taste, touch, and phenomena, <clears throat> that is mental phenomena, 
and not detaching from them. It's seeking knowledge and looking for understanding in the words and phrases of the scriptural teachings and the ancient worthies. If you can avoid giving rise to a second thought about the scriptural teachings or the stories of the ancient worthies entering the path and realize directly what they go back to, then there will be nothing in your own realm or in the realms of others that is not according to your will, nothing of which you are not the master. It's the business of clearing out the gates of the six senses. When we practice, things are different. It's a saying in Zen that in the beginning, mountains are mountains, rivers are rivers. Yep, it's a mountain, there's a river. What about it? But once we begin to go into this Mountains are no longer mountains. Rivers are no longer rivers. For some people, this is the point where they begin begin to be frightened. But when we get through, when we see, then mountains are mountains. Rivers are rivers. says, Taishan would see a monk enter the door and immediately strike him with his staff. Lin Chi would see a monk enter the door and immediately shout. Venerable adepts everywhere call this bringing it up face to face, imparting it directly, but I call it first class trailing mud and dripping water. <clears throat> okay, that's an interesting phrase, uh, and there's a footnote here. Trailing mud and dripping means getting involved, going to lengths. It can refer to expression of compassion and resort. It can refer to expression of compassion and resort to expedient liberating technique or to confusion and delusion, getting carried away. <clears throat> it's also sometimes called grandmotherly kindness. It says, even if you can take it up with your whole being at a single blow or shout, Already you are not a man of power. In fact, you have been doused over the head by someone else with a ladle full of foul water. How much the more so if at a shout or a blow you are looking for marvels or seeking subtle understanding. This is the stupidest of the stupid. What does he mean to be a man of power? Uh, Dawei uses this phrase a lot. Uh, he has the phrase, the burst of power. Not sure what the Chinese word is that's being translated. <clears throat> Could be qi. Everything is within our own breast. don't need anything from the outside. No explanation is going to do it for us. Our job is to overcome our separation. Stop standing apart. Stop looking outside. Stop looking for marvels or seeking subtle understanding. Let the mind be still. Well, the next letter is a pretty long one, so we're going to stop here. 
and recite the four vows.